I'll take this off because it's just kind of uh, you and me in here. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to this Wednesday night evening prayer service. Actually, it's a, it's a study that is set within the context of evening prayer. We are in the middle of a six-week series, and this is number five. And I mention every time, but in case somebody new happens to tune in, you could, um, if you wanted to go back, you could go back and uh, see what you have missed, although we are in the midst of a review each time. So, with all of that in mind, let us worship God. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. God reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what is hidden in darkness. God is surrounded by light. To you, O oh God, we give thanks and praise. Let us pray. Thanks and praise to you, O oh God, for the gift of your revelation of yourself, shining at the dawn of creation guiding us through the wilderness, leading us to a land of promise. You sent Jesus, light of the world, to be our way, our, our truth, and our life. Help us to follow him each day and rest in him each night until at last we may come to dwell in your eternal realm. Open our eyes, ears, and hearts to learn how you speak to us so we may hear and obey through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this point in evening prayer, we would usually have the reading of Scripture, but there's going to be a lot of Scripture in this study, so I think that we will just do everything in context with that. And so we go to the review. And yes, it is still getting longer. But here goes. We claim to be people of the book. The Bible is our primary source book. But it might seem that maybe some others in, in, in other types of churches it might seem that maybe they take it more seriously or more authoritatively or more infallibly. It is our human nature at times to uh, take things that we have been told, especially when they are passionately believed and prosecuted without much critical examination. And the charge uh, is often leveled that the PCUSA of the 21st century has departed from long held um, and cherished understandings and beliefs. So along with a basic understanding of how we go about interpreting scripture, again, it's not just a matter of whether we read it, but how we interpret it, and thus taking it seriously or authoritatively means. We sift among our own Presbyterian confessions of faith, especially those in the Reformed faith from the 16th and 17th century for guidance in our thinking about long-standing hell and hell beliefs. The one from the 20th century, the Confession of 1967, that we have been using just is used to set aside and show how this remains in harmony with what had preceded it. This may or may not challenge some previous assumptions. And we do all of this affirming the Reformation priorities 
that salvation is only by grace, only through faith, only from Scripture. So, let us review again this little paragraph from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in divers manners to reveal himself and to declare his will unto his church and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same wholly into writing which makes the Holy Scripture most necessary. These former ways of, reveal, of God's revealing his will to the people now being ceased. The infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward word of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word of God in our hearts. By him the prophets were moved to speak the word of God, and all writers of the Holy Scriptures inspired to record infallibly the mind and the will of God. Again, I know that's a mouthful, but the Bible, that is the so-called canonical, canonical scriptures, is given through the work of the Holy Spirit, who both inspired the writers and illumines the readers who ask for it. But we remember that while the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, it has, in the words of the confession, pleased God to accomplish setting it down in writing using what we might call human secretaries. Therefore, we affirm that the scripture contains the word of God, but it does not purport in our understanding to be the words of God. There are many ways to try to uh, express the dynamics of correctly interpreting the Bible. We have been expressing this in the words finding the norms within the forms. That is, the authoritative word of God among the words of Scripture. But for this course, we have selected six principles and understandings that all begin with the letter C. That's a gimmick, but maybe it's a gimmick that'll help you remember it. So let's go over them once again. The first one was community. The Bible is not a book, but a library, and is the product of several, not just one, authors and editors, but remember the place of the Spirit. The community, the, the church, has determined what books are authentic and determines what the community believes that these books are teaching. This is the purpose of the incorporation of the creeds. In our understanding that the Bible was not written by a single individual, its canon not determined by an individual, and it is not most accurately interpreted only by an individual, we affirm that it must go a little bit further than just what the Bible is telling me. Community. The second C is context. The authors are human beings, albeit led by the Spirit, but they use the language, the historical situation, the world view, the cultural norms, and all of it, the language at their disposal to speak the revelation of God. Stated in the 16th century Helvetic Confession and further developed in the Confession of 1967, which relied 
on that. So we've quoted that so many times, you can go back and look at another one if you want to hear that one again. Content. The third C is content. The second one was context. So we've got community, context. Now we're coming to content. The best summary, once again, of reform background may be stated in the Westminster larger catechism, question number five, or the shorter catechism has it as question number three. But the question was, what do the scriptures principally teach? And the answer was that what man is to believe about God and what duty God requires of man. In the Reformed understanding, this is what we are seeking to derive from the scriptures. Note that it doesn't include a factual account of history. And I've often said the Hebrews really didn't care what the details were of the story as as much as the as facts as much as what was revealed in the story about God and God's will so it's not a manual of uh, factual necessarily factual history although there may be some uh, there's a lot of factual history there it's secondly not a manual of science and thirdly, it is not a roadmap to a defined end of the world. Now, one may want to read such into scripture, but in our reformed understanding, in my opinion, that is a misuse of scripture. So we've had community and context and content. The fourth C, and this is a biggie, is Christ. The Word of God, if you want to believe the Gospel of John chapter 1, the Word of God is Christ. The word logos, which is translated word, may be translated also as the uh, essence, uh, the nature and the character of God. And the will of God is understood by Christians through the life, teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is, for Christians, the Word made incarnate. Therefore, for Christians, the authentic revelation in all Scripture, including the Old Testament, is understood in the light of Christ, who is the fullness of the revelation. That gets us to number five. We've talked about community, context, content, Christ. The one today is conclusions. That is, we're talking about the witness of the whole of the Bible seeking the final, fullest revelation. The rejection of verbal inspiration means that not all verses have equal weight or contain equal amounts of truth. Some have to be interpreted in the light of other passages which may come later in the ongoing revelation especially in the light of this previously mentioned Christ principle. So, from the Second Helvetic Confession, once again, for we hold that interpretation of the Scripture to be orthodox and genuine, which is gleaned from the Scriptures themselves, from the nature of the language in which they were written, according, uh, likewise according to the circumstances in which they were set down and expounded in the light of like and unlike passages and of many and clearer passages and which agree with the rule of faith and love and contributes much to the glory of God and man's salvation. What we are affirming is that the words of Scripture usually have 
a context. The author, recipient, purpose, history of situation, cultural mindset, language, view of the universe, and all of that. From the Westminster Confession of Faith, about a hundred years later, the whole counsel of God concerning the things necessary uh, to and for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence deduced from Scripture. Note the recognition that some deducing may be necessary to uh, discern the whole counsel of God. And while they may not have known it, at that time in the mid-17th century that they were saying that maybe some things are going to come up that are going to require the application of principles but are not just written down chapter and verse. The infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture, this goes on, is the Scripture itself. Uh, and therefore, when there is a question about the full sense of any scripture, which is not manifold, but one, it may be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. Therefore, the, uh, the, even in the 17th century, we understood that there are some parts that may have a, a, a clear statement of an idea or the development uh, may be more in keeping with our understanding of the will of, of the nature of God and the will of God. So once again from the Confession of 1967, these words, the New Testament is the recorded testimony of the apostles of the coming of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, and the sending of the Holy Spirit to the church. The Old Testament bears witness to God's faithfulness in his covenant with Israel and points to the fulfillment of his purpose in Christ. The Old Testament is indispensable for the understanding of the new and is not itself fully understood without the new. Therefore, the Bible is to be interpreted in the light of its witness to God's work of reconciliation in Christ, which says that to completely understand where the word of God may lie in the words of some of the Old Testament, we are going to need to turn to the new, the witness of Christ, the word made flesh, and of the interpretations we find there in order to fully understand what they were getting at and what they were not. Now, we're going to try to um, illustrate that with, with Scripture. So, we said uh, the Scriptures first principally teach about what man is to believe concerning God. We're going to go through a number of scriptures, but in order to abbreviate this, I am going to give you some references in some places, but not necessarily read the whole thing, or uh, we, we may be here all night. But I encourage you to take and read so you'll get the whole context. Never, you well, not... Mostly, you're not going to hear any Presbyterian getting up and throwing out a verse here and a verse there and just piecemeal and cherry pick throughout the scripture. There is always a context that is associated with it. I'm going to have to put these on if we're going to, uh, if I'm going to have to read much. In Genesis 18, verse 22, through Genesis 19, verse 29, uh, that is obviously a long passage. Um, this is, and I'm just going to look in here, this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And uh, here, and just I'm going to try to summarize what we're reading uh, there. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous of the wicked? So that where we begin reading in Genesis 18.22 is essentially, and this is interesting, is a discussion between Abraham and the creator of the world and the universe and all that is seen and unseen. The foundation of wisdom and love itself, and yet the creation is arguing with the creator and uh, that it is said that God is going to uh, destroy it. And so Abraham said, well, uh, suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous that are in it? Uh, far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. So, you know, it's like uh, Abraham is like or arguing in a sense or reasoning negotiating with an oriental potentate and uh, to to go again and so he said well god then says well okay if there's 50 and then and then abraham comes back says well if it's 50 uh, what about 45 and uh, 40 and 30 and uh, 20 and uh, finally he says that God agrees, Abraham talks him down, I will not, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way and had finished speaking to Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. Then it gets to chapter 19 and that talks about the depravity of Sodom. Now, what is given here is a picture of a whole city that is unified in, in some kind of sexual perversion. At least that's the picture that is given here. Uh, I've never seen a whole city that's unified in anything, but, you know, what, whatever. So, uh, the um, uh, Abraham... Uh, uh, Lot went out and rose to meet him and bowed down and please my uh, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. So, okay, Lot had invited these people in as his guest and then the whole city showed up at the gate and they say those two people, visitors that you got in there, send them out and we'll have our way with them. And what a ball that people have that uh, they won't say, well, you see what where, where perversion gets you. Um, so uh, Lot goes out and he wants to negotiate with the mob. Now, Abraham had a, uh, had, had a better time uh, negotiating with God than Lot has with these people. But, <laughs> but then Lot says, well, now look, we've got two strangers. We've got two guests here in the gate that, that you don't want them. Uh, you, uh, the, the context of this is the ancient uh, 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 Eastern principle that uh, hospitality to guests was almost a sacred thing. It was worse to do almost anything to than have had anything that uh, happens to a guest under your protection. So then he, he, he um, offers this and he said, um, uh, look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Uh, let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do to nothing to these men for they have come under the shelter of my roof. <laughs> Lot's trying to say, well, I have these daughters, these uh, two young women here. They're not worth much. I mean, you know, do what you want to with my flesh and blood, but don't harm the guests. Well, uh, it goes on and uh, Lot 
uh, goes into the house and shuts the door and they try to go in and get them anyway. Uh, I'm trying to figure what was so desirable about these two young men, but I guess there's some details we're not supposed to, to ask about. But anyway, uh, and then it says that the, they were struck with blindness and the men uh, who were at the door of the house couldn't find the door and uh, so they uh, went away. And so uh, the two men that came said, is there anybody else? Do you have any other family here? Y'all better get out of here because fire is about to uh, rain down. So they were supposed to uh, leave and God uh, at this point was going to destroy and did the whole city. And then Lot's wife who looks back to watch the fireworks is turned into a pillar of salt. Now, this is, the, this is the story as we have it. And so you've got a God that can be negotiated with by his creation, but is going to, uh, for some kind of uh, uh, vile activity, is going to destroy uh, everyone in the city. Well, in Genesis 9, you had another story, only it was the whole world that God destroyed. We're going to talk about that in another study, I think. Uh, as we look in uh, 1 Samuel 28, verses 3 through 19. Uh, okay, 1 Samuel 28, verses 3 through 19. Uh, this is the story where Samuel is consulting a medium. Uh, I mean that Saul is consulting a medium and, and uh, you can read the story. This is again 1 Samuel chapter 28 verses 3 through 19. And this is the story where uh, Saul wanted to know how the battle was going to go the next day. So he had banished all the mediums from the land, but they, uh, he finds out there's a woman uh, of Endor, and uh, uh, she might be able to uh, contact a, a dead spirit. And so he goes to her uh, that, uh, anonymously, and uh, when she asked, all right, who do you want me to pull up? You know, I'm not supposed to be doing this. And he says, I want to talk to Samuel. And, uh, and the woman says, oh, you're Saul, you tricked me. But anyway, he does, uh, and Saul uh, does get to talk to Samuel. And when Samuel comes up, he says, you know, look, tomorrow you're gonna lose and uh, you're going to, everything's going to be killed, including men, women, crops, the, the, the animals, everything. Now, this is seen in the light of the understanding of the rules of warfare. In Deuteronomy 20, verses 12 through 17, under the rules of warfare, it says that uh, that to the Hebrews, if you are attacking a town outside your own borders, in other words, that's not a part of your land, then uh, you have, uh, that when you take it over, you've got to kill every man, woman, child, dog, cat, mosquito, anything else that, uh, that, that you can find. That was supposedly the rule. That's the rule that God had laid down. Now, in the 15th chapter, 1 Samuel 15, which preceded this one we're just talking about, Saul has defeated the Amalekites, but he spares the king and the choices of the uh, cattle and the sheep uh, to be a worthy sacrifice to God, at least that was his story. And you may remember when Samuel comes into the camp and Saul says, I've done, I've done just what the Lord told me. And Samuel says, uh, then what is this bleeding of sheep in my ear? Why do I hear the lowing of cattle? And of course, Saul has to fess up. 
So when we get then to uh, chapter 28, which is what we were just talking about, Samuel has died and Saul had wanted him to be pulled up to find out what happened. Well, anyway, or what was going to happen. So here is the, the, the gist of, of the, the idea that God had commanded for them to commit a holocaust that would have made the Nazis look like choir boys. And, um, and they were to do that at the command of God. That's the image of God that we have earlier on. But then God develops just a little bit. So by the time we get to Jonah, uh, we have Jonah is called to go to preach to Nineveh. And in Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, Jonah is given a charge to go in and preach, and essentially his message was repent or perish. Now, Jonah did not like, he despised utterly the people of Nineveh. He did not want the people of Nineveh to be spared. He wanted the judgment of God to rain down just like it would have been for Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he was a reluctant evangelist to say the least but nonetheless he uh, went in and he was enormously successful now if uh, you, maybe that's just my failing but if i were evangelist somewhere and i went in and the whole city repented and you know we had an invitation and the whole population came out i would be uh, somewhat pleased with myself but in chapter four verses 9 through 11, after uh, God has decided that since these people repented that he would not commit a holocaust upon these people, then Jonah was mad. He was disgusted. He was angry. So he goes out and he finds the seed of a mustard plant, which had, you know, at that with big leaves, and it, it kept him uh, out of the sun. But a worm comes along, and uh, there goes the mustard plant. There he is in the sun, and Jonah is pouting. And God finally says in chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, he said, Are you angry because the, the bush died? Well, you know, think about the, all of these people that I have created in Nineveh should... If you care about a bush, which you had only known for less than a day, should I not care for 120,000 people and many animals that uh, are of my uh, creation? So we see that God has developed a little different quality that he had back in Deuteronomy 20 uh, or Genesis or whatever. As we come to the New Testament, then we come to Luke uh, 15, verses 22 through 32. You know what that is. It's Luke 15. It has those three uh, parables that we know very well. And uh, the father, uh, the son... The, the prodigal son uh, has gone out headstrong. He has uh, treated his father uh, as though he was dead and says, well, if when you die, you would give me, as the younger son, I would get a third of the property. So you're not dead, but I'm going to consider you that way. So give me the property now. And the father does it. And then he goes off, makes a fool of himself, fritters away all of his money, is starving to death. So he comes back with, the with his tail between his legs, and the father sees him. And the father says to the slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost 
and is found, and they began to celebrate. And then the rest of that story talks about the the elder son that was out in the field and he was mad because the father even let the, his younger brother come home, much less uh, kill the fatted calf. Uh, of course, this parable was told by Jesus for uh, a particular point, but the hero of this story is the father, which is God, and at this point, as we look at the prodigal, uh, at this parable, that God is, is uh, merciful even to the point of, of uh, being effusive uh, in his welcome. And then the last reference that I would give you for this in this development of God is John 3, verses 11 through 17. You know this well, but uh, we'll read this one because we have this as the fullness of the revelation of God. Um, and he, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he said, very tell you, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have not seen and yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has descend, ascended into heaven except the one who was descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And some call this next verse the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So God has developed from the one that... Uh, commands holocausts on their people, animals, and everything at one end of this into the uh, uh, loving, even indul uh, indulgent father who welcomes the prodigal home. It's the one who sends his own son to show the full scope and depth of his love for his humanity. So which God do you like better? They're both in the Bible, and you could make a, co a case for both if you cherry pick here and there, but if the scripture, this scripture that we've read, informs that scripture, then you can, that helps you sort out what is the word of God from the words that we have uh, included in places in other parts and in the Old Testament. This is what means by interpreting one thing of a fuller understanding or a clearer understanding from something that's not quite so clear. So we, these are just examples. They're all over the place and I invite you to search the scripture and, and find them. But we are looking in the Bible then for these two things. What is the nature of God, and then secondly, what duty God requires of us. And uh, I would just refer to you uh, to Matthew 5. That, of course, that's the first chapter of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, there is a series of things in Matthew 5 there that where Jesus is teaching. And that, too, may be another study, but... Uh, it goes on over and over. It said, in times of old it was said to you, but now I say to you. So the, the, in the times of old, you can find that in the Bible. But in terms of what I say to you, you can find that in the Bible as well. That is an example of where the clearer passage will inform the older passage. And so uh, he talks, you can, you can read it it's, again, that's a long passage, verses, verses, Matthew 5, verses 17 through 48, and he talks about anger and adultery and divorce and oaths and retaliation. 
and loving your enemies. Oh, that much speaks for itself. If you read that, you can see that Jesus is offering a new and fuller, and we would have to say as Christians, a more accurate revelation. Let's look at something else that starts in one place in Scripture and it changes. Uh, if uh, the, the Old Testament ideal, if you go back to the books of Deuteronomy uh, and all of that, you are going to find some extensive passages on what kind of sacrifices that you offer to God. So you offer a sacrifice in order to placate uh, a, an angry God. Well, as the scripture develops, that, that idea that, that the sacrifices exist to placate God, this is to, you know, Abraham back there is negotiating with God that the sacrifices were kind of a symbolic way to negotiate with God and it is to say to God, you know, just don't strike me down. Oh, uh, if we go to Isaiah chapter 1, uh, we're going to read something that has developed from those earlier teachings in the Pentateuch and, and other uh, places um, that, uh, about sacrifice. And then here's what even in Isaiah's time, Isaiah is saying, Isaiah chapter 1 verses 11 through 13. And this is what he said, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. But when you come to appear before me, who asks this from your hand? Trample my courts no more, bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even uh, though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the widow. Plead uh, for the orphan. Plead for the widow. And uh, it goes on. In fact, he... Uh, uh, well, that's as far as that particular passage goes. Um, paired with that might be something like uh, Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. Most anybody that knows much about that uh, uh, knows that in that passage, the question is asked there toward the end of Micah. So what shall I come, how shall I come before the Lord you know, what kind of sacrifices shall I bring? And in verse 8 is that uh, famous, uh, God has shown you what is good, O oh, uh, human, to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Uh, Hosea 6.6 6, uh, talks about love and not sacrifice. So in this, we see a development even in the Old Testament itself. We didn't even have to get to the new on that one. But you can't stop with the commandment to sacrifice. You have to look at the meaning of the sacrifice, and that is the clearer passage. So just to illustrate this thing, and really I'm, I'm coming, uh, I, I'm, I'm winding down here. But let's, let's look at this. There is a development in scripture saying uh, about uh, concerning retaliation. What do I do back when somebody does me wrong? 
Well, in the earliest part of that, we have the idea of unlimited retaliation. Uh, in Genesis 4, this is near the beginning of everything that, uh, um, uh, and verses, uh, all right, Genesis 4, 23 and 24. Lamech said to his wives, uh, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Uh, unlimited retaliation that's the beginning and so and you can uh, you can get some Bible for that but is that the Word of God is that the will of God well it develops a little and so into uh, from unlimited retaliation to limited retaliation so if we look at Exodus 21. This is, of course, uh, in the uh, uh, Ten Commandments. But here is Exodus 21, verses 23 to 25. Um, if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. In other words, if somebody wounds you, you don't go kill them and their family and their favorite dog. It means that you can retaliate only as much as was placed upon uh, as the, what you received. Now, that sounds good. Oh, that's the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I can go along with that if somebody has harmed me and don't care much for it if I've harmed somebody. But uh, in, Le in Leviticus uh, uh, 24 verses uh, 19 through uh, 21, you have a reiteration of that idea. In Deuteronomy 19, 21, you have a reiteration of that idea. But now here's something that is important. What is given here is not and never was given for individuals but for the community and for the courts. This was the idea that if somebody is jaywalking, you don't give them 99 years in jail and, uh, and $10 million fine. Uh, and if somebody has committed a, a wrong that the courts do not give unreasonable penalties. So essentially, this eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth and all the rest of that was the guidance for the community and for the courts, not for individuals in the first place. But even if it was, it's an improvement over unlimited retaliation. So we've got unlimited retaliation, that we improve it a little with limited retaliation in the next step, we move to limited uh, forgiveness. Uh, the, uh, you find this in uh, Leviticus, uh, which says, well, you're not to hate your kin, uh, not even uh, uh, ve uh, exacting vengeance or a grudge. This is Leviticus 19, verses 17 through 18. But it goes on to say that vengeance belongs to God in Proverbs 20, 22. It says, if you're going to do this, wait for the Lord. Uh, but it goes, uh, that it goes on in Proverbs 24 uh, and 25 to say that limited forgiveness, that when you restrain yourself, you even win favor with God. So, uh, you know, this is an improvement over the other two, but here's where Jesus finally ends up with unlimited forgiveness. Matthew 5, verses uh, 38 through 48. And this is actually titled in here concerning retaliation. You've heard it said, 
an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you and then uh, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy okay now see here we have that jesus is saying i realize that there has been some development here first you hate your enemy then uh, and but uh, now we have limited retaliation and then the old uh, then the next development was is to uh, love your neighbor but it goes on to say that god loves everybody who sends rain on the just and the unjust uh, uh that uh, will be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect you can go through and read that look up ephesians chapter 4 verses 30 verse 32 or matthew uh, 18 verse 22 now that matthew one you know, a while ago we talked about 70 times 7 in terms of revenge. That was in the, the Genesis 4. Now, uh, Jesus throws that back at Peter when he says, How many times shall I forgive uh, someone that wrongs me? Uh, as many as seven times. Uh, because, uh, you know, it was up to that point that three was... Uh, was had been suggested in Jesus and so Peter was trying to be effusive in his question and Jesus was more effusive in his answer he said no I tell you 70 times 7 which is back in Genesis they're talking about I will avenge a wrongdoer 70 times 7 Jesus says no forgiveness is 70 times 7 and so it ends up then with the summary of the law and you that story from matthew 22 verses 34 through 40 where uh, jesus summarizes the law that says look there is a purpose to all of this there is one guiding principle and that is you shall love the lord your god with all your heart and soul and mind and strength this is the first and great commandment that suggests that no don't take uh, grain offerings and animal offerings and all kind of offerings i mean the offerings are, are are good but the thing is that's not the purpose of of that is the idea is to love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and the second that if you do that then you're going to love your neighbor as yourself and so there is no place in that for retaliation of any kind that is where the scriptures end up so you say well i like what's in the bone eye for an eye tooth for a tooth but that ain't the last word and that's important so it's the conclusions there's a bunch more but um, i have much to tell you but you could hardly bear it all now so we'll quit there that we have one more uh, next week and uh, we'll go from there let's pray let my prayer rise before you as incense O Lord the lifting up my hands as an evening sacrifice eternal God we thank you for being with us today and for every sign of your truth and love in Jesus Christ especially we thank you for all works of Christian compassion the good earth that is our home for examples of wisdom and righteousness, for energy and strength to share your love, for each new insight into your grace, such as we have just been receiving. Gracious God, we remember in our own hearts the needs of others, that we may reach up to claim your love for them and reach out to give your love in the name of Christ. Especially, we pray for churches seeking to be faithful in these challenging times. 
We pray for those subjected to tyranny and persecution, either in the lands where they live or the homes where they come from. We pray for those who are outcasts or strangers, for those who offer welcome and hospitality, and we pray for those who need it. We pray for the renewal of those who despair in times that it's when it seems that all the news is difficult to hear and bear. Hear us now, o Lord, in our silence, those prayers which are uh, a part of our innermost being and desire and wish at this moment, this evening. God of all who worship you, make us one with all your saints and with any who are in need. Teach us to befriend the weak and welcome the outcast so that we may serve the Lord Jesus Christ and live to offer him glory. In his holy name we pray, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen.